created live on Fireside. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and how flexible are you? No, 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 I'm not talking about yoga, which is another thing I do very well, but I mean, how financially flexible are you? Today, our roundtable panel will discuss some ways you can learn to pivot faster to make better money moves. Joining us from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, it's Andy Hill. From the Afford Anything podcast, it's Paula Pant. And finally, he decided not to bail on us by going on vacation again. It's OG. Speaking of flexibility in yoga, I've done this entire open while maintaining perfect form in the lotus monkey fist pose. And I'll stay in this position while performing some book-related trivia later. And now, a guy who's only flexible enough to do downward dog total amateur it's joe saul see hi can you imagine i tear something thinking about myself doing yoga not even doing yoga hey everybody i am joe saul see hi average show money on twitter and welcome firesiders and stackers to the stacky benjamin show it's our friday episode which means sitting across the card table from me it's mr og What's happening? You're happening, man. How are you? You're here for another Friday. And and it really feels like a Monday. I got to be honest, like just <laughs> just kind of the vibe that I'm getting in the room. Isn't that is isn't that sad? Monday, but but it could be a Friday. It is so sad when the days all mix together and a woman whose days never mix together. I don't know what the hell that means. Paula Pant from Afford Anything joins us. I am completely mixed up. I can't tell if it's Sunday or Wednesday or Thursday or She's got no Tuesday. idea. I no clue, no clue. Also, what month and year is it? Well, Does anyone I, know? That I got anyone. that. Hey, hopefully we're on a downward slope out of COVID. But remember those days? You're like, what day is it? And do I wear pants today? Exactly. In fact, I once asked, like, Alexa, what month is it? <laughs> did no, you didn't. I did. I actually did. <laughs> did you really? <laughs> That's I crazy. actually did. And a guy who knows exactly what time it is. You know why he knows Paula? Because he's got two kids at home, and they will remind him what time it is. Andy Hill for Marriage, Kids, and Money's here. Oh yeah, I know exactly what time it is. It's either it's either they're they're at camp or they are home. I know exactly what time it is. Absolutely. How are you, man? So glad you <laughs> could join us. I'm great, man. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Well, I'm so sad because I don't get my Andy Hill fix at game nights anymore. For people that don't know, Andy and I used to live right down the street from each other, and I miss you, man. Well, we just got to keep importing you back to Michigan whenever you're able to come back and I'll, we'll sneak in a game night, my friend. Well, let's tell everybody because we actually thought of you when we wanted to talk about flexibility because having two kids at home, the things you talk about in marriage, kids and money, all that demands flexibility. But tell the three people that don't know about your podcast what you do. Yeah, yeah. I've got a show called Marriage, Kids, and Money, much like Joe. It's a podcast, a YouTube channel, a blog, all sorts of good things. But the the purpose of it is to help young families build wealth and happiness. And the second part is the most important because if you have the wealth built, you have that opportunity to have some flexibility. So we've talked about our journey as a family, about how we have paid off our mortgage early. We've achieved this great thing called Coast Fire with regard to our retirement savings. We paid off all of our debt. And a lot of these things help us to have that flexibility when it comes to our our family plans, what vacations we're going on, how much time we're able to spend with our kids. So that's the journey I'm continuing to be on. And I'm glad to share it with everybody that listens in. People people get lost in all the fire terminology, Andy. You got Coast Fire, Fat Fire, Lean Fire, uh, fire drill. I don't know. Uh, but, but coast fire means you were able to quit your job at a young age. Yeah. Yeah. We got to a point where we eliminated a lot of our expenses, the, the mortgage, you know, what we're always talking about saving for retirement. We got to a point where we said, Hey man, we've saved up so much that if we let this coast, we're going to be in a good spot uh, 30 years from now. So a lot of the things that brought me a lot of stress, like having to pay a mortgage, having to work a job. I didn't really like having to make sure I always had enough save for retirement. Uh, we're able to be wiped away because we worked so hard as a young couple. So 
uh, it's been a lot of fun and we're still on that journey together. Well, I'm so happy you're on this journey with us today. We got Andy Hill here. We got Paula Pant. We got OG. We got Doug. Let's get into it. But first, birthdays, holidays, promotions, getting that last sprinkled donut. There's a lot in this world we're celebrating, but nothing is worth celebrating more than knowledge, especially knowledge that will pay off, like understanding how compound interest works, learning how to check your investment professional's background, or figuring out your risk tolerance, or finally understanding all those terms your friends keep throwing around like ETF, ESG, and ICO. Learn about these investment products and more at Investor.gov, your unbiased resource for valuable investment information, tools, and tips before you invest investor.gov. All right, guys, time to talk about some financial flexibility. Today's discussion is built around like uh, many discussions that we have on Fridays is built around a popular blog post in the financial space. This one written by Jim Wang. Jim is a guy who has been blogging for a long, long time, and he won an award, Paula, that you won at a young age. Uh, what, what do they call this Plutus Award? Lifetime Achievement, right? The Lifetime Achievement Award. So I was 33 years old when they gave me Lifetime Achievement <laughs> which I think is their hint that they want me to exit out. I think that's a polite way of saying, all right, get out of the scene. Yeah, You're are, done. Yeah. Are you going to fire from financial, from, uh, from uh, writing blogs, podcasting, all that? Like you're done. I mean, I think that's what they were trying to hint at when they were like lifetime, lifetime, you've achieved everything that you will in, in your life. You're, uh, you know, 33, you've peaked. You're, you're, it's all downhill from here. Jim, Jim writes uh, in this fantastic piece, we'll share it on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. He says, as I grow older, I'd learn that it's that it is a good path, but not the only path, which is more education. He says, one of the benefits of the internet and of social media is that you can see how others are living their lives and borrow the ideas you like. You don't have to accept it all or nothing. You can just borrow bits. And he said, that's what I do with all vice on the internet. And it served me well. He says he don't want, he doesn't want to retire early, but he sees the fire movement and he loves how they're turning traditional work on its head, save aggressively, invest prudently, retire early. It's all about financial flexibility. I want to start with you, Mr. Hill, not just because you're our guest, but because you're a guy that not only owns your home, you paid off your house early. He talks about renting instead of owning is a great way to stay flexible. In hindsight, do you agree? I actually love this advice from Jim. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I made early on in my journey when I was adulting was like, hey, man, you are you graduated from college. You got to buy a house right away. Otherwise, you are wasting money renting. And man, was that a personal mistake of mine? I ended up buying a house uh, maybe a couple of years before a big crash in Metro Detroit. And I, the home value didn't return until 10 years later. When oh, I man. It. it was crazy. It was one of those things where I just felt stuck in the home. So yeah, renting, I'm all about what Jim's saying here. It gives you flexibility. There's no one right way to live. Oh, gee, you hear all the time, though, that uh, renting is throwing money away, right? Lots of people in the mortgage industry talk about that. Well, if you're selling houses, you better you better make sure the market is pretty frothy to get your uh, client list up. But uh, Andy, I did the same thing. We bought our house, our first house in uh, 2004, because, you know, God's not making any more land and uh, bought a bigger house than we should have and promptly sat on it for the next 10 years because... The market did not behave the way that we anticipated. Uh, what was the question, Joe? I totally that uh, was th th that was it. Just hearing that people are talking about oh renting is yes. it, is, it, is it bad? Yeah, I, I think you know the the pure apples to apples cost comparison isn't fair to use when you're renting versus owning a property or owning a home because if you just look at the cost, you say, well, I can rent it's eleven hundred bucks, or I could get a mortgage and it's seven fifty. If you just look at that, you say, yeah, okay, I see it. I'm, you know, I'm losing money, air quotes. But you have to add in taxes and insurance and maintenance and upkeep and the fact that, you know, when something goes wrong, you have to take half a day off to wait for the heating guy to show up. You know, like all of that stuff is an added expense that you just don't take care of or you just don't think about, I should say, uh, unless, unless you're actually 
uh, uh, doing it. And and so you get kind of lulled into that, like, well, I'm wasting money. And then, and then you get to it and you go, well, son of a gun, this, this, this costs the same, or maybe it costs even more than, than renting where you can just pack your stuff and go to another place. Paula, when it comes to renting versus buying, I know mm -hmm. you've got this situation where you do both. Like you, you, mm -hmm. I think you own a place and you rent a place right now. Correct. Yeah, that is correct. So largely the, whether renting or buying is, is better in a person, a specific person situation depends on um, the cost of living, the price to rent ratio in the area in which they live. If you live in a very expensive city, if you're in New York or San Francisco or, um, you know, one of, one of like a, even LA, um, if you're in a very high cost city, oftentimes it makes more sense to rent, particularly if you're going to be in a given location for fewer than five to 10 years. Jim says, Paula, that there's some upside. He says that if you rent your home, you could leave as soon as your leaf, lease ends. Heck, if you want to leave before your lease ends, you could just go. You're going to be responsible for, for paying the rent or subleasing it, but you don't have to sell the house. But if you own, oh. you're on the hook for everything. And he says renting could be expensive, but, and I think this is a big but, you pay extra for flexibility. Do you feel like that's the, the kind of the renter's agreement? See, I disagree with that. I find that owning provides greater flexibility than renting in that you have the autonomy to decide to rent out your house. So if you want to leave that home, you have the autonomy to decide to rent it out. You have the autonomy to decide who the renters are going to be. You have the autonomy to decide if it's going to be a short-term short -term or long-term lease. I mean, if you are under the, the control of a landlord, then there are going to be restrictions within your lease about what you can do with that property. You may not be allowed to sublet it, for example. Or if you can sublet it, you might not be allowed to um, sublet it on a short-term lease. You know, the, the landlord can put all kinds of restrictions in there that um, that tie your hands. Whereas if it's your property, you get to decide what you do with it. It sounds like so, all things being mm -hmm. being equal, you prefer owning. Yes, yes. All things being equal in a moderate cost of living city in a place like Indianapolis or Atlanta, I think that owning is a better uh, choice, but I would not say that about a high cost coastal city. Indianapolis or Atlanta. Like it's, it's funny how you just randomly pick cities like uh, <laughs> Pawtucket or Kalamazoo. <laughs> that's, that's the deal. Uh, he's got a quote in here though, Paula. And, and man, I like this quote. He says, this is from fight club. The things that you own end up owning you. I think there's some truth in that. Uh, uh. I, I feel like it's a little bit of a platitude that doesn't really have teeth um, because at the end of the day, broadly speaking, you have decisions about what you want to do. And if you don't have the right tools, then you can't do certain things that you want to do. We couldn't be podcasting right now without a certain set of tools. Does that mean that these podcast tools own us? You mean tools, like, argue, you mean tools like Doug? Sha. <laughs> why? why? Why was that necessary? <laughs> I'm sitting here quietly in the corner like you told me to. I couldn't you help come it. Out swinging. It was right there. I'm sorry. Paula, back to you. <laughs> well, we couldn't be podcasting right now without the podcasting tools at our disposal. Now, does that mean that these own us? I would argue to the contrary. They free us. They allow us to do the things that we want to do. Uh, the second one on his list here, uh, Andy, back to you, my friend, saving aggressively. He said, it took me a long time to realize that money is time to retire early. You must have uh, thought about that during your journey to get the heck away from work. Yeah, I, I would love to say that I'm retired early, but no, I, I just really like the concept of fire and everything that everybody's doing. I'm doing my best to, to make money in this uh, wild digital entrepreneur world, but Yes, I definitely saw saving as my outlet outside of the job that I didn't really like. And for a period of time, I think it was about 10 years of our marriage, we were saving about 50% of our income. And we were lucky enough to be making, you know, I think on average, maybe like 170K a year. So saving 50% is a lot easier that way. Yeah. But uh, we got used to it. We got used to being able to live on sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 a year. And with that, it gave us the freedom to make some choices when, when the time came, like when Nicole wanted to say, Hey, I'm, I'm interested in stay, being a stay at home mom with the kids. Okay. Because we're saving half of our income. You you have that choice. Or later on when I was like, I'm about to, 
tear my eyes out if I have to continue selling stuff that I'm not passionate about. And she said, hey, well, we've got that option now. So why don't you go try something new? So yeah, uh, it definitely is true uh, that get, it, that saving aggressively helped us to create some more options in our life. Paula, how long has it been since you've worked for somebody else? Since 2008. And this idea that money is time, you know, if you give up the job like Andy did and you work for yourself, is it more of a struggle to save? No, um, it depends on how much you're making. So I don't think that that's the good, delineating. That's actually a good point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I don't think that the delineating math, factor is uh, is whether you work for yourself versus whether you work for someone else. I think the delineating factor is how much are you making, and and how can you separate your income from your expenses, like like Andy talked about. Yeah, I mean that that's more of just a budgeting thing. Like if you're working for yourself, then you pay yourself a salary. And so you create a distinction between your business revenue and your personal income. Yeah, but still, I, I still think that's the huge part of the two. Like, I, I don't know. I've met people who make $250,000, $300,000 a year, and they're still having trouble making ends meet. Why? Because of the fact that they spend money like it's water, Paula. Well, that's that's the issue. But I don't, think that that, uh, I don't think that that's specific to running your own business. I mean, you could certainly be an employee making 300 K a year and also be spending money like it's water. Sure. Yeah. I didn't mean the yeah. business piece of that. I meant the piece about, about making it so it's easier for you to do what Andy did. Mm. Yeah. I would say, I, I mean, honestly, I think having a high income makes everything easier. You know, the, there are certainly people who are making 300 K who are not managing their money well. And that high income probably enables some of that laziness um, or, or some of that lack of attention. But all that being said, um, if you have the option of either making 300K a year or 20K a year, you're going to have a much easier time saving money on 300. <laughs> Agreed. I totally agree. You can, you can, there's I a, never thought of it that way. <laughs> if I just made a million, I could, I could save way easier. Well, and, and so that's why like the platitudes, like, oh, it's not what you earn. It's what you save. Like those platitudes are so incomplete, right? They, they don't capture the reality of the situation. It's what you earn and what you save. Correct. We need a new platitude, Paula. <laughs> Oh, gee, but there's two pieces of this. When, when Jim says that money equals time, I think about two things. I think about, number one, what, what Paul is talking about, make more money, right? That's piece number one. But number two, you see these people that do side gigs. They sacrifice more time to get where they're, they want to go, and you see them actually trade time today for future time tomorrow. Fair trade off. I think like what Paula said, it just kind of depends on what you're doing with that extra stuff on the end. It's easier to save more money if you make more money. But, and while that's, I think somewhat true, if you don't have the good habits when you don't make a lot of money, you're not going to have the great habits when you do make a lot of money. If you can't give away $50 a month when you make 50,000, you're not going to give away $500 a month if you make $500,000. So you have to have those, you know, those um, behaviors established, even with the smaller dollar amounts to the best that you can. But, um, but if you're, if you're thinking about money and uh, time and how they're related, um, the, 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 the one of those that's impossible to get more of is time, right? Like it's just, it just, it, it runs out. And so, if you're going to uh, use something like a, like a side hustle income to generate more cash, I sure hope that you're using that so that you're buying more of that time in the future, like you said, and not using it for consumption. You know, especially if you're on the other side of the income curve, like we're like Paul was talking about before. If you've checked all the boxes of being able to handle all of your needs and those of the people around you, and you're also just working in order to just be able to blow more money, I think that's a mistake. The the next one here, Andy, I think hits you directly, which uh, Jim writes, give loyalty sparingly, if at all. He says you should be loyal to friends and family, not necessarily to the company you work for. We see people, though, all the time, Andy, and you must have seen people around you. Well, and even I know in the position that you were in at you, your work, you were in a management role, like there were a lot of reasons you could have stayed loyal to your company. Was it hard to give up some of that loyalty and leave? 
You know, it was. It was a great company, and I really appreciated all the people that I work for. It's just that I fell out of interest with the the job that I had. I did it for about 15 years. So uh, knowing what I used to make and the benefits that I had and the good people that I had surrounding me to help me do the work, it's definitely hard when I look back in hindsight being like, hey, now I'm a solopreneur. I'm making like a quarter of what I used to make at my other job, and I don't have any of the benefits. But <laughs> would I trade it for uh, what I have now? I, I'm like working like 20, 25 hours a week. I'm working on stuff that I absolutely love. And yeah, I make maybe a quarter less of the money, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. I absolutely love it. Uh, Jim's right here. I mean, loyalty to your family is more important than loyalty to a company. And that's that's what I found. How do you get people OG when they get to that point that Andy's talking about to actually make the jump? Because as Andy said, that's really tough. Well, uh, sometimes you just need the permission to do it, you know, because the first thing that um, Jim talks about here is, is how it was ingrained in him to go to school, get a good job, and you can uh, f- uh, fulfill all your obligations, you know, with those things. But then you get to that point and you have been able to fulfill all your obligations or you have the ability to step away or make a change. A lot of people get trapped in that and say, but I don't, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I should. And sometimes a, 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 a blogger, a podcaster, a financial planner, an accountant, a, a good friend needs to step in and say, no, you've done all the things the right way. You have the ability now to do the next thing. And, um, and sometimes you need that other person or sometimes you just need to convince yourself that you have permission to, to uh, take a step back and say, yeah, now I'm going to go do this other thing that I really like doing. I love that idea. Run the run the numbers first and have somebody else look for your blind spots. Andy, did you do that? I'm I'm sure you did. You must have. Well, you know, I'm 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 a good nerd, so of course I did. Yes, of yeah. course. No, I uh, um I we saved up uh, a good runway of money. Uh, we were going to get into rental properties. I was very uh, impressed with the you know, great work people like Paul have done with rental properties. So I'm like, that that's the train we want to be on. And then after a while, we just decided that wasn't something that we wanted to do with two small kids, sort of another job, uh, or at least felt like that. And so we decided to use that runway of money. I think we saved up about seventy five or $100,000 just to be like, hey, if this thing goes to, to hell in a handbasket, uh, at least we got some money to live on. Um, that's good. And, it was uh, like a burn rate, right? Like you're- It was, you're, yeah. yeah little runway. Yeah. So that, that helped us a lot. And obviously we looked at the numbers quite a bit and had a high savings rate and I had a really supportive wife. I mean, out of all of it, really, honestly, she was the one that kind of pushed me, uh, to, to make the leap. And, uh, two years later I'm still alive. And so she, so is she, and so are our children as well. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is, you're still around. Hey, uh, still Paula, around. uh, Paula, next up on this list is protect yourself at all costs. And I know that as an entrepreneur, you think, well, these, these may be some things that I'm going to let slip, but it also seems to me that if you're relying solely on yourself, protecting yourself might be a little more important. Yes. And so I, I love the phrasing of the headline, protect yourself. In his writing, he talks specifically about insurance. So he talks about renter's insurance, homeowner's insurance. A point that you've often made, Joe, is that when people focus on insurance, they're focusing on product. Whereas when you frame the discussion as a focus on protection, then you're focused on the end result rather than a specific product. So while various forms of insurance, like homeowner's insurance, um, are good forms of protection. Asset protection more broadly, like in a holistic sense of the word, is I think a um, an under-talked about and very important focus of like a good financial plan. Which piece of that plan, OG, that Paul is talking about, do people generally ignore or get wrong? I think most people ignore anything that could be bad that happens to them. You know, um, uh, most people uh, have car insurance. Most people have homeowner's insurance, mostly because it's mandated, right? You know, (laughs) the mortgage company requires you to have it. But then you think about something that has a far higher certainty of happening or probability of happening, I should say, like being sick or hurt for an extended period of time. and, and, And you say, well, I don't need to do that. I'm a pretty healthy guy. Or I, I drive pretty safely. I don't. I, I'll, I'll never be in an accident. And um, obviously, the last 15, 18 months have taught us that uh, uh, that, that we don't know what the future is going to hold. So I think I think probably the more overlooked stuff is the stuff that involves 
admitting one's own um, mortality. Sticking with you, the last point on this list is to build up that emergency plan. He says we've all heard about emergency fund, but having an emergency plan is equally as important. What does what does an emergency plan look like, OG? We talk about it when we work through financial planning with clients. We call it the responsibility game plan. And the whole idea is think about all the stuff that can go wrong while you are not in a status of, of uh, high stress. Because you don't make really good decisions when you have a lot of other stuff going on. And it's not fun to think about some of the protection stuff that we were talking about just a second ago. It's not fun to talk about your estate plan. Uh, it's not fun to think about the stock market going down 30% or you getting laid off. But those things happen. And if you've got the opportunity while you're of relatively sound mind to kind of game plan that stuff, here are the things that we would do. Here are the first, you know, here's what the first hundred days would look like if this thing happens, then uh, put it on the shelf and then you're good. Your brain will uh, be able to recall that and and certainly uh, some notes will help. But if you follow the plan that you thought of while you were like Jim says, cool, calm, and collected, you know, you have a better chance of making good decisions along the way. You try to figure it out in real time. There's too much other stress going on. I think it's time for us right now to move into our trivia. For those of you who are new to this game, you may not know that our three normal contributors, Paula, OG, and Len, have a year-long trivia competition going on that we have here during our chats. And let me scroll to see what the heck the score is right now. And actually, what's funny is I do not have the score in front of me. But I do know Paula, no. Paula's tied for second. Because she won last week, last week That's right. in absentia. I did? Whoa. Yes. See, all I have to do is not be here and then I do better. That's right. So congratulations, Paula. And wow. OG you is pulled in, in a ringer. <laughs> that's right. And OG is in first place, which means uh, OG is going to guess first. Andy, because you're representing Len Penzo, our returning champion, you're going to guess second. And Paula Pant, you will guess third. Doug, you ready to do some trivia with us, my friend? I am, Joe. Let's rock. Here we go. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, your best friend. And did you know that today just so happens to be the anniversary of the first book ever published by Penguin Random House? Penguin is also getting ready to publish their best book ever, now available for pre-sale, Stacked Your Super Serious Guide to Modern Money Management. Wow, Joe. Well-written plug there. I didn't even see that coming from like a mile away, which for some reason reminds me of some of the worst books ever published. Hey, like, uh, like the Like The Manly Art of Knitting. Hey, I'm not knocking knitting, but come on, how big is that market? Or uh, everything I learned about women I learned from my tractor. And did, did Doug just go away or was it just me? He told his joke and then he <laughs> dropped the mic and left. He dropped the mic. <laughs> he just bailed. He's like, everything I learned about women, I learned from my tractor and walked away. <laughs> That's but, No, there's more. That is all we need to know is that he just Thanks, learned Doug. it from his tractor. Is is Doug back? Do we got a Doug? We do. We uh, do not have a Doug. I'm here. <laughs> there there he is. is. Every, welcome back. Yes. Welcome back to the show, Doug. Uh, you want to finish what the, the heck? Did you guys lose me at some point? Y yes. You just got done. You dropped the mic on the tractor. So uh, you apparently, know what happened? My, I had an incoming call. Oh, you need to put it on airplane mode. Uh, okay. If I put it on airplane mode, how are we? We'll cover that later. Okay. <laughs> here Interesting. We, here we go. Back. We're not editing that out. That was exciting. Let's go. So so you fell off something about falling off your tractor. All right. So I've got some more top-notch examples, but first, let's get to today's trivia. Since we're talking about Penguin Random House, what year did the company publish its first book? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can start yet another book. You probably won't finish because there aren't enough pictures in it. <laughs> oh, that's the best trivia read, Doug, you've ever done. That was that was fan, fantastic. Uh, You're I welcome. just I just got the update on the score. This is live podcasting. The score is uh, ten to nine to seven. By the way, according to our official scorekeeper Karen, so file your complaints with Karen. But that doesn't change things. 
Paula still has the honor of going third. OG, oh, you're kicking this off. Penguin Random House's first book. When uh, when did that come out? Oh my goodness! I didn't even know there was a tr- there's a question in there. <laughs> uh, so the question is, when did Penguin Random House have their first book? It's it's like their birthday their today. Book? Yes. Okay. Well, penguins have been around a long time. Nice. I'm certain. Uh, books have been around longer than penguins, maybe, or not as long. I'm going to go penguins are longer than books. Um, Magna Carta was signed. Uh, I'm going to say in um, 1911. Penguin Random House, 1911. Mr. Hill. Uh, 1875. Sounds like a well-reasoned guess, my friend. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm just doing a little lower than uh, than uh, OG there. Just trying to make the make it <laughs> wide a difference for Paula. Which, oh, uh, yeah. oh boy, Paula, you gonna walk through this for us? I know. Well, I mean, I guess my options. Do I want to? <laughs> I'm gonna capture the upside. 1912. Oh, you're not even gonna go through the options. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. I... Let's see. Let's see if um, not talking through my mental process will improve my probability of actually winning this thing. Well, let me ask you this. Your let me ask you something. Your mm-hmm. your mental process is usually around <laughs> w- w- the upside or the downside. But you must think that it was after 1912. I mean, so when you think about Penguin Random House, what are your thoughts there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I I'm assuming it's a it's a not a newer. I mean, if something was made in the 1920s or 30s or 40s, that's not new. I guess it it seems like it would be too old if it were made in the 1800s. Joe, this is a woman who didn't know what day it was. Do we want to know her thought <laughs> process right now? <laughs> that is that is true. She once asked. Well, a you're you're <laughs> turning the wrong rocks over here, man. We'd love to tell you who's going to win this thing, but we don't play that way. We will be right back. I want to talk about the most fun, stylish, charged up electric car out there, the Mini Cooper SE. It's an electric unlike any other. Looks like a Mini. Drives like a Mini because it is a Mini, electrified, perfect for the city or for the burbs, stand out from all other electrics, and then speed up. It's Mini go-kart handling with an electric charge starting at only $29,900. Reserve yours at MiniUSA.com. Finding a great new podcast can be time-consuming, often disappointing. I found that a lot myself. So let me save you a bunch of time tell you about a podcast I know you're going to enjoy. You've heard Mike Carruthers here before, and his podcast is called Something You Should Know. Every episode is Something You Should Know, just like when you've heard Mike do interviews for us here at Stacking Benjamins, delivers more of that same fascinating information you can use in your life and help you understand your world better. In every episode, Mike talks with leading experts on topics that really affect you. In fact, just recently, Mike and his guests have talked about why great ideas almost always fail first, why watching sports is good for you. I watch a lot of sports, so I must be incredibly healthy, and how to stay safe in a dangerous world. They often have financial topics, but much like Stacking Benjamins, a lot of stuff that's financially adjacent just makes you feel great or smarter because you listened. They're these fascinating stories, and they're always going to leave you a little smarter than you were before, and that's What's great about Mike is that he asks these questions to get to the heart of the topic, the kind of questions that you'd ask. Something You Should Know is a fun, entertaining podcast. You'll learn something new and useful in every episode. It was listed in Apple's Shows We Love, and listeners have given it thousands of five-star reviews. Give it a listen, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Search for Something You Should Know where you get your podcast, and when you see the bright yellow bulb, start listening and you're going to thank me later, stackers. Something you should know. OG, you kick things off with 1911. Feeling pretty good now. You've got you've got a little room on the bottom side there. I have absolutely zero clue whatsoever. <laughs> Mr. Hill, if it's before 1875, well, even into the 1890s, you're good. I guess so. <laughs> I know books have been around for a while. I just don't know how long. On, on, on your different times being here for the trivia, have you won yet? Uh, I don't think that I have won yet. Well, maybe today's the day. Paula, Whoa. 1912, feeling good? I am. I am feeling good about it. 
Well, let's see. Doug, you ready to go? Let's uh, have an answer. Hey, stackers. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm back. In an honor of Penguin Random House's birthday, check out some of these more horrible book titles. Like, who's the agent that approved Why Cats Paint? A Theory of Feline Aesthetics. Totally needless book. Everybody knows why cats paint. It's all the stress they have in their lives. Or how? why did Malcolm Bradbury need to write a book called Eating People is Wrong? He clearly hasn't tried using everything but the bagel seasoning. That's magical. Or how about my favorite horrible title, It's Not Gonna Get Any Better When You Grow Up? Yeah, thanks, Drew Bledsoe, for inspiring children everywhere. I'd feel the same way if Tom Brady took over my job too soon maybe anyway now hopefully that instilled in you the confidence to write your own at least mediocre book title so let's get back to today's trivia the question was what year did penguin random house publish its first book even though random house published their first book in 1934 and penguin wasn't far behind with their own first read in 1935 the two companies didn't merge until much later which means the first Penguin Random House book was published the year they merged, which was 2012. Gotcha! Paula is the winner. Paula loses by a wow. century and still wins. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice job, Paula. Only no on press needed. <laughs> Only on the Stacking Benjamins podcast could I be a hundred years <laughs> off and still be the winner. It's it's like you're playing that. Have you ever played that game cornhole, Paula? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you throw the bean bags into the thing. Yeah, it's like you guys all picked up the bean bag and threw them behind you, and Andy threw it the <laughs> furthest behind you. Nice job, Mister Hill. <laughs> That's right. I was I was playing some eighteenth, uh, some nineteenth century game, so I, I wasn't even in the, in the league of cornhole. <laughs> so Paula gets the win this week. First half of our conversation, guys, we talked philosophically and big picture. I want to bring it down to tactics here for the second half of this amazing panel on flexibility. Uh, we're going to take out the magnifying glass and help everybody do better tactically with their money. Uh, today's episode brought to you by magnifymoney.com. Andy Hill, you know what happens when you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money? Uh, lots of good things, evidently. <laughs> Only good things. You find yourself skipping around the neighborhood, my friend. And everybody's like, oh, Andy Hill must have just gone to magnify money. Using, I learned a lot. <laughs> using the stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money link. I'm sure the magnify money people are like, that's a read going off the rails right there, Joe. Over 92% of those financial products that are at your brick and mortar bank, probably not the best in class. In fact, almost every single online bank is uh, compared and contrasted at magnifymoney.com. So whether it's savings accounts, checking accounts with no fees, savings accounts with higher interest rates, high interest savings accounts, uh, CD rates, it's all at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. So let's go back up here to the beginning. Uh, 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 Paula, when we, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a real estate question because I know mm -hmm. when you and I are together that you're always like, Oh, please more real estate questions. <laughs> Cause I know you'd never do this stuff. Uh, if you are, if you are buying a home, your mm -hmm. best tactical, tactical piece of advice on that initial purchase. Tactical piece of advice. For a personal residence, I would say have multiple exit strategies. So before you purchase that home, uh, think through what you would do if you had to suddenly move away, if, if you're a two-income couple, if one person loses their job, um, if you, you know, think, think through those different life scenarios and make sure that you don't buy a home in which the only exit strategy is that you would have to sell. Mm. Make sure that that home has, um, you know, based on its price point, its location, its HOA uh, restrictions, make sure that it allows you to rent it out if you need to, um, and that that would be financially viable. Like, make sure you have multiple exit strategies. Let's talk, OG, about the mortgage a little bit. I know you've seen these mortgage acceleration plans, the ones that involve maybe taking out a home equity line of credit and paying off your mortgage more quickly. Uh, do you like those types of strategies to pay down that home loan? 
I think mathematically they work. I, I, I believe that the vast majority of people will eventually follow that up and will end up costing more than, than, uh, than it would just to do it the normal way. I'm a much bigger fan, especially with interest rates as low as they are right now of, uh, having a 15 year term on your, on your primary house. I would love to get a 30 year term on my rentals, but for some reason they're not interested in that. They only want to do you want a 70, like, oh, no, want to do, you want a 70 year term on your rentals. I, know. I want to do a hundred year loan on the rental <laughs> and a 10 year loan on the primary. Uh, but if you can't trust yourself with saving extra money, uh, then one of the best ways to save money is to not have a house payment. Andy knows this. Uh, it's pretty fun not having a house payment. So I, I would say that that if you're in the market for a house, I love what Paula said, you know, be careful on what you spend money on. Don't walk into houses that are outside of your budget. Just remember how everybody's, uh, you know, aligned. The real estate person makes more money the bigger house they sell you. The mortgage person makes more money the bigger mortgage they sell you. So you have to set your own boundaries there. So 15 year, that w- that's what I would say. Andy, did you use any of these mortgage acceleration plans that you see out there? Did you just do what OG says? Just whack a bunch of extra money on it. We did the old school throw extra money at it. Yeah, I've seen some of these too. And yeah, uh, some of them could mathematically make sense. But if it could also throw you for a curveball and you've put some payments on your credit card in order to accelerate your mortgage payoff or whatever, it it, it could could go uh, off the rails pretty fast. So no, whenever I would get a bonus, we'd throw it there. Whenever we'd get a tax uh, refund, we'd throw it there. We'd sell stuff on Craigslist, uh, you know, old baby gear, you know, old purses, you know, old clothes, things like that. All the extra money that we had during a four to five year period just went towards extra principal payments. And it was as simple as that. We, uh, you cleaned, we kept at it. you cleaned out the house at the same time. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know what? It's good to have a minimalist wife. That's great. <laughs> that, uh, that appreciates a tidy home because she was down, she was down for it. And it helped us to make a clean, uh, simple living too. I, I, I spoke with Ty and Talat uh, McNeely, like I'm sure you may have, and they, they used a similar approach. They started gamifying it, seeing how much of their stuff they could sell. Absolutely. And it's, and it's, it's actually kind of relieving to just like ridding yourself of a mortgage is stress relieving. It's also nice to walk around your house and get rid of things you don't use anymore or things that don't bring you joy. Uh, so walking around, you know, picking them up, obviously seeing if they have a little bit of value on Craigslist and Facebook marketplace doesn't help. It doesn't hurt, yeah. but Hey, even if it doesn't have value, maybe it's somebody else could have some joy uh, and getting that as, as a giveaway. So, you know, not only are you paying off your mortgage, you're actually reducing the amount of stress in your household as well. Let's, let's stick with you, man. Uh, saving aggressively was the second tip. What is a tactical thing that you use or that you've tried to maybe squeeze out a little extra saving that you didn't think you could do? Yeah, honestly, it was just, uh, I'd say the main thing would be for advice for people would be uh, just find an amount feels comfortable for you and try to continue living on it even after you increase your income uh, because I'm not sure that there's much more happiness that goes with spending a ton more after like $70,000, $80,000 a year. I think there's been some (laughs) studies on that. So if you can find some future happiness by saving today, by not increasing your lifestyle, watching out for that lifestyle inflation, that's what we did as a couple. We were making, you know, like $130,000 a year when we got together and we decided to live on half, uh, which was about whatever $60,000. And we've continued to live on $60,000 for the, you know, 10 plus years of our marriage. And we've been a, we've been a happy couple. So I think just watching for that lifestyle creep, especially as new money comes into your life saying, what can we do with this new money to make some big moves for our future? Paula, your favorite uh, hack to maybe save a little extra money? Uh, I would say realizing that money is time. And, and constantly thinking of money not as, um, not as an object, but as a representation of time. I think that once that's deeply internalized, that informs a lot of decision making. But you're talking more philosophically. I'm talking about, is there an app that you like? Is there a automatically raise the amount going into my savings you know, per month? I hide money from myself. Any of those mm. strategies that you use? Uh, the hiding money, I, I hide money from myself. That's, that's a good one. Um, putting money into a savings account that's at a different bank than the one that you normally use. And then intentionally um, not ordering checks, cutting up the debit card, losing the password for the account. There you go. 
so that the only way you can access it is by getting in your car and physically driving there. It's hard to knock Paul off the philosophical stuff. She's, I know. She's, like always, <laughs> she's always, got a lot of gems. It's hard. She's always Aww. any big picture thinking. And I'm like, come on, Paula. <laughs> uh, uh, OG, when it comes to helping people make more money, what's a strategy for people to, to earn more? I think the biggest thing is to figure out what it is that you like to do and see if there's a way that you can turn the thing that you like to do into extra cash. And uh, Andy was talking about um, they they like to be uh, a, a little more minimalist and, and you kind of turn that into a little bit of a game. I have a hobby that I participate in that we use for all of our holiday spending, all of our holiday travel. It, uh, it, it goes for a couple, three months. I work a little bit at it uh, in the evening and, uh, and throughout that kind of uh, time leading into the holidays, I make enough money to fund our holiday travel and our holiday budget for the year. So I, I think anything that you can do to fill the space with something other than television or, or whatever, especially if it's something you already enjoy doing, you know, you're thinking about like financial independence is getting to the spot where you're only doing the fun stuff. And if you have to work, if you have to, if you're not quite there yet, well, you can still have some fun things that you do a hobby or, or a volunteer work or something like that. And if you can turn that into something that is an opportunity to make a few extra dollars, yeah, it's a, it's a, Double bonus. I want to stick with you on a in, double whammy, but double, whammy, <laughs> double, double bonus. bonus. D, uh, I want to stick with you on insurances. I know Paula Wideness, which I definitely, and I know you definitely like, dude, uh, talking about, let's not talk insurance. Let's talk about the strategy. But when it comes to saving money on insurance, wh- where do you see uh, people maybe have some opportunities? What's a nice hack for people? I think you have to comparison shop. Number one, you have to group everything together in one place as much as possible. Quite often you get some really substantial discounts. One of the things isn't really a hack. It's don't be the person that has claims, <laughs> you know, like drive responsibly. So you don't have tickets and smash into things. Um, a real easy crazy one talk. right off the, what's that crazy That's talk? Good, right? yeah. We were sitting next to somebody and after dropping my kids off this morning, my wife and I were sitting in the car. We look over the car next to us is like the whole front end is all crumpled. I'm like, well, don't get in front of that dude. Oh, yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care at this point. Um, I think I think one of the easiest things is check your deductibles. You know, if you've got a if you've got a cash reserve, which you should, and your deductible is five hundred bucks, change it to a thousand. If you get if you got ten thousand dollars in your cash reserve and it makes sense, change your deductible to twenty five hundred. That'll have an impact immediately on the cash associated with your property and cash lead type stuff. Yeah, make sure you got that emergency fund first. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, and I know we talked about emergency plan earlier, but emergency fund, Andy, when you were accumulating that money, we look at what inflation's done here lately. You want to have a high interest savings account. Wh- where did you actually go? What did you do to keep your emergency fund actually making a little money? You know, during during the period of time, and it's changed so much, or even just over the last three years, uh, we worked with um, uh, Ally uh, for an online savings account, just kind of taking things out of our our regular checking account, making 0.01%. And for a period of time there, we're getting 3%, 2%. Now it's gone down quite a bit, but still having it separated from our checking account has been fantastic because we can label our accounts with purpose. We can label this one's for emergency. This one's for vacation. This one is for uh, our future hot tub fund. You know, when we put a label on it, it becomes more fun and it becomes more real. So that sort of separates things for us. But we've always, uh, we've kept around a three to six month emergency fund. And then after the pandemic, man, six to nine months sounded pretty good to us <laughs> for yeah. emergency savings. So I know that's different for everybody. No, but I love that. Well, two things. Number one, because of the fact that you're self-employed now, right? I mean, having that extra money, but then also second, just your experience uh, went into that, Andy, like finding your own experience over time and factoring that in, I think was hugely important. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's what everybody should do it take into take into consideration. I, I've talked to some people that feel good with two years of expenses. And that's saying that can seem like a lot. But this gentleman that I interviewed and, and talked to deeply, he he got hit by the recession really hard. And it was one of those emotional things that just made him feel more comfortable having a lot put away. So yeah, it's, it's all personal. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, thanks a ton for those strategies for people. It, I think, uh, I think that was just a fantastic discussion. 
Hey, that's going to do it for this week, everybody. We're going to have our guest of honor go last and talk about what's going on where he lives. Uh, but OG, big plans this weekend? Yeah, busy, busy weekend. My oldest is a freshman in high school this year, and two a days start this weekend. Oh, oh, oh. So, Ouch. kind of excited. He's going to be hurting. Yeah, he's been doing a little conditioning. So he's going to be right. hurting. That's still, man. Paula Pant. Thanks for hanging out with us again. Congratulations on the big win. What's oh, uh, I'm thrilled I won. Yeah. <laughs> what's going on at the Afford Anything podcast? On the Afford Anything podcast, we have an interview with a economics professor from Boston University who is talking about uh, what's happening right now in the overall in our overall world, uh, what's happening with inflation, what's happening with the markets, like how do we understand the year 2021, which apparently is the year that we're in right now. Apparently, because you asked Alexa. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really, really interesting. That, that, that sounds that sounds fascinating because I feel like there's things moving really fast uh, right now. Yeah, exactly. There's been so much change that I think you know it's hard to really wrap your head around. Right. What is going on at this moment? You know what what is this post pandemic economy that we're all living in? And so that is what our discussion's about. And that's on the Afford Anything podcast. That is awesome. Wherever finer podcasts are found. Mr. Hill, so happy you could hang out with us, my friend. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me back, man. You know, not only, I should tell people, not only are you going to tell us what's going on in a second at the podcast, but people also need to check out your YouTube channel. And, and I think your YouTube channel just hit a big milestone, didn't it? Yeah, you know, I've been uh, at it for about six months kind of seriously, and we just got over 3,000 subscribers, that so things are going really well there. It's fun. So fantastic. We'll link to that on our show notes page. But tell everybody who's coming up and what you're doing at the Marriage and Kids and Money podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Marriage, Kids and Money. Again, you can find that uh, anywhere you find podcasts. But uh, one thing that we love to do is feature real stories from real families doing some amazing things with their money. So over the next couple of weeks, we've got some uh, families that have hit the net worth milestone of $1 million. And we're going to be featuring those. Those those are folks that listen to the show, real families all around the country. And then another uh, another family that just recently paid off their mortgage as well. So showing people how to do this crazy stuff and then what it takes to a lot of the things that we talked about for, for Jim's article today, you know, aggressively saving, uh, planning for the future, and then creating some options and freedom in your life. So yeah, what, you can find all that at Marriage, Kids, and Money. What I love that you share, Andy, is just how many of these real people's stories, like these people have really done it, and they've done it so many different ways. Absolutely. Yeah, there's not one right way to do it. And that's why I love to share these because uh, sometimes we hear personal finance advice out there and it's pretty pre prescriptive. If you don't do it this way, then you're, then you're doing it wrong. And I, I disagree with that completely. I think there's so many ways to, to, uh, to do this and, uh, find the flavor that works best for you and run with it. Marriage, kids and money and afford anything. You'll find both of them wherever you're listening to us now, uh, go subscribe or follow wherever you are. Um, uh, wherever you listen to podcast, that's going to do it for today. Everybody, Doug, Kind of from here, man. You think you can make it all the way through without dropping the mic? You didn't. You didn't ask me what I was going to do this weekend, <laughs> Doug. Doug, what are you going to do this weekend? Um, no, nothing. <laughs> I just but wanted to be included. Here, here we. We're including you right now. What should we have learned today? <laughs> So, what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our roundtable. If you can build financial flexibility into your life, that gives you more freedom to crush your finances and also avoid huge financial setbacks. Second, I learned Paula uses a lot of big words, so lesson for me is to bring a dictionary to these recordings. Hey, OG, later on, can you tell me what platitudes and autonomy mean? But the big lesson... After reading some of these awful book titles, I'm more certain than ever that El Caminos are for lovers who will outsell F. Scott Fitzgerald. That dude was a hack anyways. Am I right? To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To tune into more from Andy Hill, check out the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast. And for more from Paula Pant, check out the Afford Anything podcast. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, reminding you 
Make plans for the weekend so you don't have awkward moments on live podcast recordings. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. If you're new here, you, we don't talk about the after show. If you have to talk about it, which some people have in the past, we call it dessert. So um, we've made that one little exception. I'm, I'm so glad, OG, this week we did not ditch our guest, which we inadvertently did last week. Andy, we, we forgot to tell Roxanne last week, our guest, that we had an after show. And the second, the second we stopped, she was gone. Oh man, good thing I'm not a noob. She was, she <laughs> was totally gone. I was so embarrassed. I'm like, whoops. Hey, I thought something we'd do, and Paula, I, I know I'm going to regret this. I will probably regret it, but I thought we'd have a session because we haven't done this in a long time, where mm -hmm. we actually talk about what we're what we're watching on TV or movies that we saw. And every time Paula goes, I'm not really watching any of those. But, but I thought about you the other day because season two mm -hmm. of one of our shared favorite shows, Never Have I Ever, is back. Yes, I'm so excited. So season two of Never Have I Ever just dropped. I have not seen it yet, but it is high on my list of things to do. I'm so I've been following the entire cast on Instagram. I've watched the first two episodes and as hilarious as the first uh, season so far and the setup, I won't spoil it what happens, but it is, it, it's amazing right out of the gate. Oh, great. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. So I'm what so are you, excited. so what are you watching besides that? Nothing. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Andy, you guys got to be watching something at your house. You could, th th I would imagine with two kids at home, you must subscribe to like Disney plus. Oh yeah. We've got the Disney plus my, my daughter's a big fan of Marvel movies. So we're, we're catching up on uh, the Loki series. Did you like the, the Loki Falcon series? Well, I've only, we've only watched the first three, so okay. don't spoil it for me, but nope. I've heard really good things about how it ends. Have you liked the first three though? I have, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, Oh, what's the other one? Uh, the, the other the other series uh, with um, I can't remember her name. Anyway, they did another TV series, uh, and oh, it, it kind of starts off kind of slow. Wandavision. Wandavision. Thank you. Yes. It kind of starts off kind of slow. You're like, what's going on? It's very kind of cryptic. But then by the end, you're like, actually, that was really good. So I'm hoping the same thing happens with Loki. <laughs> I, I I won't spoil it f for you, but I will say not to get your hopes up. Oh no! Yeah, that, yeah. That kind of you kind of spoiled it for me. It was it, it was okay. It <laughs> was that not going to spoil it for me. I'm not going to spoil it, but it sucks. <laughs> but it sucks. I, I didn't mean that. You're wasting your time. <laughs> I didn't mean it sucks. It wasn't a waste of time. It just, I it it just is. It's confusing. Are you finding yeah. it even the first three? I, the confusion doesn't go away. Well, I tell you what. That once the, once a, once a movie and a series gets all about time travel and different dimensions, I'm lost. Yeah. I'm like, all right, you, you lost me at time travel. Yeah. I, I got nothing. Where the hell are they now? Right, right. That happened to me in Man in the High Castle, Andy. I don't know oh, if anybody. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that's but... the that's like the dystopian World War II kind of thing. Yeah. What if the Germans won yeah. World War II? And it had enough going for it just on that premise alone. And then out of nowhere, they start like going to alternative realities. I'm like, whoa, yeah. totally unnecessary. And now I'm confused. You just I remember seeing the opening episode for that. And I'm like, this looks really interesting. And then it I did didn't look up with it. It did look very interesting. I'm surprised, yeah. Doug. Yeah, it's. How many seasons just, did that have? Has, hasn't that had a lot oh, of like seasons? Four, three or four? A lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a it was a lot of content there. And I I just I made it through two seasons. I stuck with it and then I just gave up. Oh gee, I I uh noticed that Billions, one of your favorite shows, is on uh Amazon now. And so uh, I said to Cheryl, I'm like, oh, you're going to love this because I watched episode one on a plane. I totally forgot how episode one starts. 
And Cheryl's like, you wanted me to watch this? <laughs> Do you- That's right. I, I just remembered it now when you just said it. Yes. It, uh- there is a dominatrix who's standing w- w- with a stiletto like on this guy's chest. <laughs> And, and she, the episode finally gets good at the very end. <laughs> well, this yeah. is at the yes. very, this is at the very, oh, at the end of this no, episode. The episode of this podcast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you finally get it. And by the way, we finally heard some, some uh, laughter there. I have to say this too. Some people thought that we, we've installed a laugh track and they're like, I don't like that, that you guys installed a laugh track. Like, we don't, we don't have a laugh track. We have uh, laughing that uh, the fire. We have trombones. Do. There you go. Oh, that's my favorite game show. <laughs> that that was your theme today, Andy, for that. <laughs> the price is wrong. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. OG, OG, what are you watching? I finished watching the first season. I don't know if there's multiple seasons, but I finished watching the first season of The Flight Attendant finally. I don't, I don't really get a lot of chance for TV, so I, I watch like 20-minute increments while I'm eating lunch or something. With Kelly, um, Kelly, yeah. what's her name from? Um, from Big Bang Theory. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If yeah. only there was a place for us to look that up. And um, I, sus- I, I think they set it up for more seasons, so I don't know if there are more, but I haven't checked, checked back. Um, Doug got me on Succession which I'm waiting for the next season for Yeah, this fall it's coming out. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I saw an ad for it. And then, um, uh, waiting for the second half of billions. So I don't know. They kind of stopped in the middle of the season, so to speak, because of COVID last time. So I don't know what the story is there. I haven't really looked into it. And then I just picked up starting watching the Pacific on HBO. The Pacific. What's what's the Pacific about? Uh, you'll never guess. (laughs) It's about the Pacific ocean. In a manner of speaking, it's about World War II and the the, the oh, Pacific you mean campaign. like Band of Band of Brothers, the Pacific? No, yeah, but that, yes, except I mean the Pacific, not Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers was Europe. I don't think you're being specific enough. No, awkward. <laughs> it's got the dude from uh, Silver Spoons in it. Oh, for Ricky those Schroeder. Of you who are old enough to know who Silver Spoons is? That's an that, uh, but that series has been out for how long? Forever. Yeah. Okay. It's, so what do you want me to do about it? 2010. You, just asked, you asked the question. You didn't say, hey, give me something that's out brand new that you're watching. I, I, I did not. I don't have an answer for that. Right. You said, what are you watching? So I said it. Now I'm getting crap for it. So <laughs> and sorry. I'll, we'll stop giving you crap about it. What are you watching, hey, Joe? Doug, what are you watching? I think we're, uh, uh, what am I watching? Well, uh, never have I ever. I've got uh, two episodes of that. First episode of Billions, just finished Loki. And um, what else? As somebody, my sister and brother-in-law told me that I that, that I need to see a series called The Patriot. Have you guys watched The Patriot? I have. I've watched. I think they watched the first season. And didn't hook me. Uh, they see, I hooked me long enough for like whatever seven episodes or something, but I didn't continue. They loved it and said I have yeah. to watch it so now I'm on the hook got to watch that has has good moments definitely yeah. Joe one of your recommendations I think it's the the, the last kingdom or the lost kingdom oh my I, goodness the I last kingdom oh yes last I'm, kingdom I'm fantastic. in the fourth season on that one I, I can't stop watching it it's great. you watched yeah, that one OG fantastic. didn't you no I don't Did, know what it didn't is. watch yeah, the last kingdom really good TV I'm not even gonna, I like how Paula's on like permanent mute she's already gone to sleep yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I have not seen any of these things, like, nor have I heard about any of these things. And, and we are surprised. I got, too. A, I got a recommendation for everybody. Can, is my mic on? Can you yes. Is this thing on? Yeah. Um, last night I watched The Sound of Metal. Fantastic sounds, movie. You saw that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, have, really, really good. Have you seen that movie, Andy? You'd really like it. Uh, no, I haven't. I was actually just typing it when when, when you were saying it, so yeah. I unmu- unmuted myself. What's it about? It was up for an yeah. Academy Award. It won two sound editing and, gosh, something else. But, but it was up for yeah, best. So it's a heavy metal well. drummer, yeah. heavy metal drummer who loses his hearing, and uh, it's it'll give you a lot to think about. It's really well done. All right. I remember that. I, I think I remember. So whenever the Academy Awards come up, my wife and I look at all of the trailers and we're like, all right, which movie do we most want to get depressed from? And then we choose, we choose that one. I remember seeing the trailer for that one. 
uh, and we decided not to get press, depressed from that one. So you know, is, it, is it depressing? I don't know if I would say that. Um, I like the it, end. It's not, I think the end yeah, is pretty I was uplifting. Say, and it takes you a minute to realize what's happening in that very final, like, 30-second scene. But I would agree, Joe. I think that is uplifting. But um, through up leading up to that will give you a lot to realize how much you should be thankful for in your own life. And but it's you know it's challenging, definitely, to watch some of the some of the scenes. But the acting is fantastic, really genuine stuff. And um, right at the very end, it, it kind of it it wraps up really nicely. Yeah, I th- great recommendations all around, guys. We'll list all those. Well, we won't list them in the show notes page, so I hope everybody wrote them down. I forgot we don't list anything that we talk about here. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. The market is constantly changing. The Marketplace Minute keeps you up to date one minute at a time. While you're packing for a weekend getaway. Alexa, play Marketplace Minute. All operators file for bankruptcy. While the grill is warming up. Hey, Google, play the Marketplace Minute. For upward swings and in indices in Europe and Asia. On your way to a summer festival. Hey, Siri, play Marketplace Minute. Says it's been spending more on hiring The more- Marketplace Minute, a podcast and smart speaker briefing updated three times daily. Ask your smart speaker to play the Marketplace Minute. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.